Okay. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody um, from OBCT and CESPI to this webinar in the framework of the research projects financed by in the Unit for Analysis and Policy Planning uh, and the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. So we are here today for this uh, online uh, webinar. Let me... Okay, here, um, I'm gonna illustrate to you the program. So we're gonna have uh, uh, the opening remarks from Ambassador Andrea Cascone from the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then we're gonna share with you the research findings uh, uh, of this uh, research uh, project uh, that will be available online on the website from uh, CESPI and OBCT uh, next week. And then we're going to have a very rich uh, um, panel with different uh, representatives from uh, uh, civic society and, and human rights activists, uh, journalists, media experts, uh, fine analysts from uh, the academia from uh, Western Balkan countries. Uh, we're going to conclude with the open debate and the concluding remarks uh, with the director of OBCT, uh, Luisa Chiodi. So um, let me introduce you, Andrea Cascone, to open the session of this uh, webinar and to welcome you at this uh, um, webinar today. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you today, this afternoon. Um, I really appreciated uh, the timing of this event, which is absolutely very much appropriate. I must also apologize in advance for not being able to stay with you during the whole conversation. Unfortunately, uh, the region is keeping us very busy, uh, especially in the latest uh, uh, days. So I will have to um, leave at a certain point. But uh, thank you very much for having given me this opportunity to uh, just speak a little bit about how Italy sees um, the Western Balkan regions and its uh, uh, European perspective at this uh, uh, at this stage. Um, I, well, uh, I think it's very clear to everyone that the um, the war in Ukraine is uh, among many uh, effects it has had so far. It has also uh, created a new momentum in the enlargement policy of the European Union. Uh, which was not there for quite some time. Um, and unfortunately, um, the lack of uh, uh, momentum in the enlargement has had several um, effects in the, uh, in the region, uh, among also EU member states. Um, what is important is that the um, dramatic consequences uh, created by the uh, Russian aggression against the Ukraine, I mean, clearly showed once again the geostrategic value of the enlargement as a, not just as a policy, but as a, I would say an existential dimension of the European Union. Um, we have uh, for a long time as member states, founding member states of the European Union, we have insisted on the fact that the European Union does not have other choice, but to go in two directions deeper into the integration and larger into the uh, uh, expansion of its membership. And for us, the Western Balkans has always been considered an historical and uh, uh, part of the uh, European Union. Now, the clear effects of this new momentum were seen in 2022 with some uh, positive and concrete steps. Uh, the, of course, the opening of negotiations with the North Macedonia and Albania, which was long overdue. Uh, but also visa liberalization for Kosovo that was finally um, moved forward in the council. And hopefully this will become a reality from January 1st, 2024. And finally, in December, we um, uh, succeeded in granting the candidate status for uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I would say 2022 was indeed a very successful year for the enlargement process. But that's uh, where and now we uh, it comes the first challenge for the European Union, because of course, 2023, when we look at what is potentially the low hanging fruits for the enlargement, uh, we don't see the same kind of uh, uh, results, uh, or let's say the same targets that can be achieved over the uh, of the, this this year. In fact, we have already almost finished the um, uh, Swedish uh, semester of presidency without real 
um, developments on the contrary, uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, um, developments on the grounds uh, for, do not help at all for making the case of Western Balkans, although they are very much, I mean, related to Serbia and Kosovo uh, dynamics. And we should be, we should make very uh, clear that this should not affect the whole, uh, the whole region. But it's a fact that when we have this kind of tension, this kind of crisis, the whole region remains affected at the end. And that those who are skeptical, and we still have several member states that are skeptical on the uh, European integration process of the Western Balkans, somehow uh, see good reason for being uh, skeptical. Now, um, what could be achieved in 2023? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not so, um, I would say, dynamic as we saw in 2022. That's why uh, the discussions in Brussels and Italy is among those member states who are pushing this kind of discussion are focusing more and more on what are we call the uh, measures for accelerated or gradual integration. Uh, and so to look at very concrete steps that we can take as a European Union in order to facilitate and to start integrating the candidate countries and the potential candidate countries in the life of the institutional life of the European Union. Um, this is something that a debate has been already started under the Czech presidency uh, with very, some very interesting idea. You're very familiar with the idea of staged accession a gradual integration. There have been several models that have been run by think tanks. So this has helped a lot also to uh, nurture the debate among member states. And there is, a, there is a good moment also in this discussion because there is a core group of member states that is pushing for this kind of gradual integration. Um, connected with this uh, uh, challenge, there is another one which I, I would like to uh, point out. And the challenge is that of course, um, the new momentum was created because of the Ukraine and war uh, and aggression. And this uh, momentum uh, for Ukraine remains very strong. I mean, the political pressure to make Ukraine advancing on the European integration process is very strong. Um, I must really uh, uh, confess that it's, uh, it's amazing how Ukrainians are moving ahead with the reform suggested by the commission. And the, and the European Union. Um, and this pressure, this political pressure to give some sign to Ukraine will continue for the coming months. Uh, now, uh, Italy's position on this aspect is that of course, we support Ukraine perspective in their enlargement process, but we, at the same time, we have to uh, be very careful in balancing our approach also with the Western Balkans. Uh, there has been, from the very beginning, uh, a fear or a perception in the region that Ukraine could somehow uh, bypass the uh, uh, Western Balkans and become the front runner of the enlargement process. And this is uh, a perception that we have to take into account and we have to make sure that does not turn, this perception does not turn into a sort of frustration from the, uh, from the Western Balkan countries. Uh, and this is, I think, the two things we absolutely need to avoid at this stage. The first one is that this new momentum in enlargement turns into a new frustration in the region, new delusion for not seeing the uh, enlargement process uh, of the countries in the Western Balkans to move uh, as quick as the one in Ukraine, or in any case, move forward. Um, I think everyone who goes in the region meets with people in the Western Balkans immediately sees this uh, perception, whether it's you know, uh, based on true facts or not, but there is this perception that the EU has been using double standards in its enlargement process vis-a-vis um, -vis the Western Balkans and the other member states who have joined the union from 2004 on. And, uh, and I think it's uh, no one interest to, um, to make these feelings uh, going up. We have also to be very conscious that the part, a good part of the Russian disinformation in the region tries to play exactly on these feelings, tries to undermine the European Union as a credible partner in its uh, enlargement policy and uh, tries to undermine the value of the European Union by jeopardizing the perspective of the European integration process. 
But there is another, uh, 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 another scenario that we must absolutely avoid. And then this is a scenario where the countries in the region themselves might think that the political pressure in the region uh, would be, because of Ukraine, would be enough for them to move forward. So in other, wor in other words, they would just sit down and not do uh, much on term in terms of reforms. They're just hoping that Ukraine will help them to move forward. So this is uh, something that needs also to be taken into account because when we look at what uh, important reforms the region has approved over the last, I would say, three years, honestly, we, we have not seen much. We understand that the lack of uh, um, political will to move uh, with much bolder approach on reforms was also because of incentives from the European Union. But definitely uh, this should not be taken, uh, this momentum should not be taken for granted, should not be taken as a way, an easy way to move forward without doing its job. Even those countries like Italy uh, that support very much the European perspective of the region understand and see uh, the transformation of value of the enlargement process that can happen only if the regions um, and the countries in the region move forward with their reform. Um, this brings me to uh, the end of my uh, short introduction. Uh, I, I mentioned several times in my um, remarks, the interest and the role of Italy. Um, for us, I mean, from the very beginning, uh, the uh, enlargement process towards the Western Balkans has always been a top priority. This is a matter of uh, national security, first of all, for us, as being neighboring country, I mean, along the Adriatic uh, uh, Sea, uh, of course, we uh, feel, we see, and we know very well how important is the integration to complete the integration process of this uh, region and to make sure that this uh, country complete their transformation into full-fledged dem democracy, into full-fledged um, open markets. Uh, this is a, an opportunity that we cannot miss it uh, also to complete that historic mission that was started with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, of the Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet uh, bloc. And uh, today's um, developments in the, in the continent, the European continent, uh, show that this is really the time to move with a more decisive pace and to uh, complete this uh, mission of uh, integrating the Western Balkans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... Sorry, I'm sharing, okay, my screen. Uh, thank you very much to um, Andrea Cascone. Uh, so we go back to, uh, sorry, here. Voila. Okay, there it is. Um, yeah, so we um, uh, welcome to the newcomers to um, the webinar. So um, we're gonna move on and uh, present you um, a short synthesis of the research uh, um, article that uh, uh, will be published online next week from uh, OBCT and uh, CESPI. So this uh, study that is part of a larger project uh, um, intended to uh, answer to two main questions. So one is related to the factors and dimension that can explain the possible increasing risks of instability in the Western Balkan region with a focus on Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then the second is related to the EU enlargement process, if it could accelerate or hold back due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the study uh, that took place in the um, last month uh, relied on desk review and field interviews, a public uh, debate that uh, will take place today. Uh, so I leave the floor to Francesco Martino, my colleague, that uh, will explain to you more in detail the aspects about uh, Serbia. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome and uh, thanks for being here uh, with us today. Uh, we have very little time at our disposal. I will use uh, uh, this opportunity just to share with you some of the impressions and ideas that uh, came out of uh, our research uh, during this month uh, and to ignite, if possible, uh, the um, uh, discussion that is going to happen. I would really like to leave as much uh, time as possible to our discussions for a fruitful discussion after our presentation. So 
Um, very briefly, uh, I would start from uh, maybe a smaller element uh, which could uh, help us understand better how deeply uh, the discussion about Ukraine and the war uh, has penetrated the Serbian and Western Balkans uh, public debate, uh, um, an element from the political vocabulary, uh, commenting on what's going on in Kosovo in these last uh, um, weeks. Uh, uh, Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic uh, claimed that uh, um, Kosovo Prime Minister Albin Kurti dreams of becoming a new Volodymyr Zelensky. So, uh, of course, we can have uh, different takes and points of view on what it uh, means and if to be called Zelensky now is an insult or, or a compliment. But I think uh, this gives you an impression how much uh, speaking about Ukraine and the war in Ukraine, uh, again, you know, has become part of the public uh, discourse uh, in Serbia, in uh, particular but in the Western Balkans uh, as a whole. Of course, it's very difficult to summarize in a few minutes what this impact has been, the impact of the Russian invasion of, um, of Ukraine. Uh, what is very clear is that uh, for most of Europe, uh, uh, we are now living through a new framework when it comes to perceived security issues. Uh, and this is particularly true, of course, for the Western Balkans and uh, um, Serbia in particular. Why? Because Serbia is the country in Europe uh, uh, with the most complex, to say so, international position uh, when it comes uh, to the new confrontation between the so-called Euro-Atlantic world or the West, if you, if you prefer, and Russia itself. In these last years, uh, Belgrade has long tried to balance between the two in what reminds a bit of the policy of non-aligned, um, which was followed by Titus Yugoslavia, uh, choosing on the one hand, for example, to pursue a full integration into the European Union, but also preserving very strong uh, uh, political connections uh, with the Russian Federation. Uh, this is because of uh, several reasons. I will mention just a couple of them, maybe the most important ones. One is very uh, practical, uh, that is uh, the uh, energy resources that comes from Russia towards uh, um, Serbia. The other one is purely political, the strong backing that uh, Russia provided all this time long to Serbia um, on the international uh, theater when it comes, for, for, um, for example, um, to the final status of Kosovo. So the first uh, important outcome of the war is uh, an increased pressure on Belgrade to take sides. Um, this pressure came mainly from the West, but I would say from both sides, uh, and uh, uh, it has it had, uh, important consequences on uh, Belgrade's policies in this year and a half. All in all, Serbia uh, tried to maintain a uh, kind of very uneasy neutrality between uh, uh, or unstable neutrality between the, the two uh, conflicting parts. Uh, in its official positions, for example, in the United States, uh, Belgrade has repeatedly aligned with the West uh, in condemning uh, the invasion of Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, Vucic has claimed very uh, clearly that uh, Serbia is not going to abandon all friends, uh, even signed new energy agreements with Moscow after the war started, and refrained uh, over and over uh, on imposing sanctions uh, on, on Russia. Uh, Serbia is uh, currently uh, the only country in Europe, maybe together with uh, uh, Belarus, not imposing sanctions on, the, on, on Russia. Um, I would say that uh, the main preoccupation, especially in the first phase of the war of, after the body, was the opportunity that... Uh, a new second front could be open in the Western Balkans, uh, uh, especially through the strong influence of Russia on Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, namely on Republika Srpska. One year and a half uh, after the, the, the start of the invasion, uh, because of several reasons, also because uh, Russia encountered uh, uh, a lot of difficulties and setbacks on, from a military point of view in Ukraine. This opportunity seems very uh, hard to materialize at the moment. So a second front uh, never really um, uh, was never really opened. Uh, Russia is far away from the Balkans. 
has no boots on the ground and has been uh, has become weaker uh, after uh, the war started. But this doesn't mean, of course, that uh, Russia has lost all its potential to play the part of a rival power in the Western Balkans or a spoiler, as has been very often uh, described. Uh, this is true for uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I will let Anna say something more about it. It's especially true for Kosovo, and we've been say, uh, seeing this uh, in this last week. Um, not by chance, uh, since the invasion of Ukraine started, uh, a series of crises interested the, the relationship between Kosovo and Serbia, namely the registration numbers crisis, uh, new bar barricades in the north, uh, and lately the violent confrontation uh, between uh, Serbian uh, protesters and NATO troops uh, in the north of Kosovo caused by the attempt by Pristina, Pristina to impose its mayors in the north after uh, local elections had been uh, largely boycotted by the Serbian population. Uh, it is very, very difficult to determine how much Russia is uh, behind all of this uh, or this uh, new instability is uh, better the consequences uh, the consequence of uh, an issue that far too long uh, uh, Pristina Belgrade and the European Union um, haven't been able to to solve and this is one of the questions that I would pass on to the the panelists uh, in, in our discussion of course uh, what is new and interesting is the uh, West's response to this very last crisis with positions for which for maybe the very first time seem to be much closer to Belgrade than to Pristina. If this is a, a way to appease Serbia, trying to bring it to the West field uh, and depriving Russia of its best or even last friend in Europe, uh, as some analysts are suggesting at the moment, uh, it's another of the questions that uh, um, are still without a clear answer. Uh, and that I would like also to discuss further in the in the discussion. Uh, I will just say uh, very uh, last words about uh, the shift of, or the lack of it when it comes to the public uh, opinion position, certain public opinion position regarding the war. What is interesting is that uh, uh, it uh, there is a, I would say a different perceptions on. Uh, uh, what happened in this uh, in this month and year and a half? Uh, surely the media we can see the media shifting in the in the in the accent. Uh, in the very first phase of the invasion, uh, most of the media were clearly pro-Russian. Uh, now there's a debate if this has shifted a bit, you know, like uh, towards a kind of uh, balancing. Uh, what is interesting, uh, and maybe uh, this linked also to what uh, Ambassador Cascone was saying, is the fact that the public opinion in Serbia hasn't become, uh, as, as far as it seems, more prone to uh, looking for uh, faster integration in the European Union. Uh, was this seen in other uh, regions in Europe, like Sweden or Finland? There was, in this uh, very insecure environment, uh, a clear will to look for security inside uh, the Western world or NATO in this specific case. In Serbia, there seems to be um, uh, a different situation where the public opinion uh, doesn't feel closer to the European Union uh, uh, more than it used to be before the beginning of the invasion. So I think there's a, a lot of uh, uh, food for thought uh, uh, from this point of view. Uh, what is, seems to be interesting that according to many of the people we talked to, um, the fascination towards Russia in Serbia is not that much connected with what Russia is, but with what Russia is not. Uh, that is, it's not the West. So very often uh, the Serbian public tends to support, support Russia also from uh, uh, a value point of view, uh, because it represents an alternative to the West. So uh, I think there's uh, would be very, very fruitful and interesting to, to discuss on how to uh, bridge this, uh, uh, this gap and reach out to the Serbian public opinion. Uh, if we really want to uh, go further with the with the European integration of Serbia too, so I'll stop here and give uh, um, a word to to Anna for his part, and I'll be very happy to join the discussion later on. Thank you.
Thank you, Francesco. Okay, there we are. Sorry, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I'm gonna uh, focus on the um, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, case. So political stability in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina was already let's say fragile and a risk before the invasion of Ukraine. So uh, our um, review and our uh, study aims at understanding to what extent the internal and external factors have been affected by the Russian invasion uh, on Ukraine based on the um, uh, perspective and the point of view of different uh, uh, analysts uh, and uh, representatives. So uh, first of all, when the um, invasion occurred, the uh, first moment of uh, um, sentiment of solidarity and empathy came up in the country, followed also by different manifestations uh, pro and contra the uh, invasion in the different uh, entities. And this led the floor to fear and preoccupation in the country, um, feeling to be a possible next candidate for growing tensions. And also this opened up to different perspectives that could go east and west for the country. So either look at the opportunity to pursue a sort of a, um, increase in the chest the session is the discourse or joining the EU or the NATO. And also our um, experts uh, mentioned that uh, the perception in the country was that before the invasion of Ukraine, the feeling was that the EU main concern was on Chinese influence in the Western Balkans or in the country. And then after the invasion, there was the disclosure of the Russian influence in Republika Srpska or in Serbia. And this so bring us to the um, analysis of the uh, internal factors that have been affected by the war in uh, Ukraine and that they represent also an increasing risk uh, uh, scenario. So uh, the, the factors of instability and possible risk in the countries in the country are many. And first of all, the um, uh, secessionist discourse and attempts uh, from Dodik in the Republika Srpska that uh, creates the um, elements and conditions to boost internal tensions, and also the growing elements from political nationalist oppositions and polarizations. Also, the, the country brings up uh, its uh, own weakness in terms of uh, youth immigration that uh, brought a loss of human capital and then the weakness in the civic society that has not uh, the right tools probably to uh, in front of national political forces. And the, also the rigidity of the state due to constitutional mechanisms or the uh, pan-Slavic ideology that is still a cultural element in the country. And then uh, the internal elements are interlinked with the external factors and dimension that uh, um, involve uh, uh, the, the growing risk of instability in the country. So here again, are, it's just a synthesis and you will find more in detail all these elements, but uh, one of the main issue is the foreign policy from uh, the Russian Federation in the Russia agenda to maintain instability in the Western Balkan region and especially keeping Bosnia and Herzegovina a dysfunctional state using different tools that are financing extremist and nationalist groups, using soft power and especially propaganda in the media. So information has been uh, turned into a war to in the countries as uh, uh, in Russia and in uh, um, Ukraine, but also in Western Balkan countries. All the surrounding um, conflicts also, as we saw in the tensions of Kosovo, can impact in the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And also the enlargement fatigue that, of course, is not a strong element to bring um, Bosnia and Herzegovina into the uh, EU um, environment. And, and then the main uh, uh, separatist influence from the uh, Republic uh, of Serbia supporting the uh, Serbsk Republic and Dodik. So uh, one of the main questions was uh, to what extent the war in Ukraine could be a trigger for internal uh, tensions or growing violence in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So 
mm, most people answer that it's very unlikely that something can happen in Bosnia in Herzegovina given to the uh, Russian or Serbian direct military support uh, or move for different reasons that uh, in a way tells us that it's uh, not wise and safe to enter uh, a, a military or a, a violence uh, state, but also we have elements that are telling us that in the country something is changing. So nationalist groups are growing, divisive and uh, aggressive narratives are taking place, uh, Wagner groups around the Western Balkans are popping up, and then also in the Republic of Serbska, uh, armed capacity is increasing. So uh, overall, the Russian objective is to keep instability in the region. And as we all know, something is impossible until it turns to be possible. So it's very unlikely that something happens, but it could be possible. And there are elements that are telling so. So in order to avoid a risk of escalation in tensions in the country and in violence, concrete signals are needed. And as uh, Cascone was telling us, we really need these elements not to turn into a frustration. And they are needed in the interlink between external dimensions and internal dimensions and framework. And immobility, uh, that means nothing is happening in a way it could be good, but could not be enough to move on. So at the external level, in the external framework, uh, signs are needed uh, uh, in terms of what's going to be next uh, for uh, Bosnia for the uh, after the candidacy as a EU member state. What's going to be the attitude between the EU and Serbia for this ambiguous balance between EU and Russia? What's going to happen at the um, USA political election level or what's going to happen between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine? But mostly at the internal level for uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, changes and signals are needed to be stronger in their impact. So antidote against the nationalist waves uh, are needed, the reinforcement of the civic society in this sense, uh, working on uh, counter information and then uh, uh, giving the floor to uh, needed reforms and safeguarding territorial integrity. So these are all elements that I think our uh, panelists will uh, discuss and pick up very easily. So um, I stop here. And uh, um, now I'm going to introduce uh, the panel of discussion that is very rich. And uh, um, so we have uh, um, four uh, panelists is uh, Sasha Seregina, uh, um, activist uh, in uh, Belgrade and coming from uh, Russia. Uh, we're going to start with her. So please uh, get ready, Sasha. Sasha, she studied uh, um, uh, engineering, uh, architecture, design, and then uh, she moved to Belgrade. She worked there and she entered the um, human rights floor. And when the war in Ukraine started, uh, she uh, co-founded a, a movement, a peace movement that she will uh, more explain to us uh, uh, in a while. So we would like to hear more from Sasha about uh, her anti-violence movement uh, in Belgrade. So how is it going there and how it started? And also, uh, as a Russian activist living in Serbia, from your point of view, how do you see the situation and how do you see also the Russian community uh, being there, uh, being uh, pro-Putin, against Putin, or what, what is your point of view from this? Thanks. Okay, Anna, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction uh, and you and Francesco for the invitation. It's a pleasure being with all of you today. Uh, so, um, as you said, um, yeah, I'm a civic um, activist uh, from Belgrade uh, of Russian origin, and I live in Belgrade for 12 years so far. So, um, uh, so let me just tell you very briefly uh, about the group uh, in question, so just that you get a little bit of context. So our group is called uh, Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Serbs together against war. So it's abbreviated as RUPS, and so because it's a bit too long. <laughs> and uh, so our group was founded on 24th of uh, February 2022, on the very first day of uh, the uh, full-scale invasion. 
Um, it uh, started after the spontaneous uh, protests uh, in front of the Russian embassy in Belgrade, which uh, proceeded to, to the Republic Square in Belgrade. So here, where, uh, here was the place where people spontaneously met to protest against this uh, barbaric act of invasion. And so there we people who, who met there realized that we are coming from like Russia, Ukraine, Belarus and, and Serbia. So this is uh, basically how the group started that day. And after that, uh, we have um, organized uh, numerous anti-war rallies, uh, cultural and humanitarian events, uh, public debates, um, film screenings and so on. And as well as we're doing uh, like daily uh, social media, anti-propaganda work and like um, information, uh, information work. So um, yeah, our group is an um, informal group so far, which means that uh, it is not a registered organization or NGO. It is uh, like a civic activist group uh, so that uh, all the resources that we are like, investing in the group are our own and uh, like volunteer resources are uh, it's based on that kind. So um, yeah, um, and um, I may say that uh, when the group started, what was uh, maybe particularly interesting for the context of Serbia and anti-war anti activism in Serbia is that um, actually uh, the very, um, Maybe even the majority of uh, anti-war initiatives in Serbia in the very first uh, weeks and months uh, of the invasion, in a way, came from people of Russian origin or like Russian and Ukrainian origin. And uh, uh, this was very, very clear uh, at the very first rallies, as well as uh, the majority of protesters that were attending our rallies were coming from, from that region. Um, well, maybe two thirds at, uh, at general. And uh, yeah, although with the time uh, there were more and more people from, from Serbia, from Belgrade joining and, and there was always also a, like a small core of uh, very uh, experienced and devoted Serbian activists that joined our group from the very beginning and who are with it uh, until now. And, and yeah, who are very important part of our work. And one of the, like successes maybe of our group is also that this the the proportion of uh, uh, Serbian people in in the movement in the activist group is now like much uh, much bigger and uh, the majority of active members of the group are from Serbia now so I'm in the minority <laughs> finally <laughs> yeah so well when it uh, comes to the particular impact or like the kind of informal assessment of the impact of our um, activities uh, so far. Um, I believe uh, uh, they did had, uh, have some uh, significant impact to the whole picture and uh, all the initiatives like ours and, and our others. So, and um, particularly when it's uh, in the very beginning after the full scale invasion, it uh, kind of um, Filled some essential gap in the pu public discourse and in the in the public opinion here, because um, in a way uh, it was very um, obvious at the very beginning that uh, all the anti-war um, voices uh, here are either very discreet or like um, um, not not as loud or not articulated very much um, and very well compared to the very uh, loud and aggressive, uh, you know, right-wing and uh, nationalist and and pro pro Russia, pro Putin uh, side. So um, uh, and and when I say uh, when I call it a gap, I in a way I really think so because um, uh, in the very first uh, weeks and months of the invasion, it was um, very very apparent how all the traditional media and the social media were like turned in the, into the pro-Russian propaganda outlets and, and, and the whole, uh, almost all the political scene, especially mainstream political scene, scene remained silent uh, or, or like these voices, as I said, were, were quite discreet, which was for me uh, as a, you know, as a citizen was really 
um, shocking and surprising uh, fact, given that uh, Serbia is a candidate uh, to the to the Europe, has a status of candidate to the European Union, and uh, the process of of the you know accession is is like uh, officially on on the way, ongoing. So um, uh, the other thing that surprised me uh, in a way is that. Um, not very much, uh, very much civil society uh, voices were, you know, uh, also uh, very, very loud when it comes to, to the reaction uh, to the full scale invasion, which seems to be at the moment like very logical and uh, the most like very important instant reaction to, to what is going on is, is usually comes from the civil society, but when it comes to like formalized organizations in Serbia, I could name, still could name like very few, maybe three, four or maximum five organizations from Belgrade or, or, or the whole Serbia that I know that were clearly, you know, articulated their activities in, in support of Ukraine or in, you know, in, um, in the sense of condemnation of the, you know, brutal, brutal invasion and war crimes committed by, uh, by Russia in Ukraine. And yeah, maybe the very, very quite clear example of that uh, comes from the recent weeks, um, for example, when it comes to um, ecology and green and leftists and NGOs in Serbia, it is very clear uh, the, the total absence of uh, the reaction to the um, you know, disaster uh, caused by the destruction of Novakahovka Dam over Dnipro. So, um, you know, this is something like basic, basic reaction uh, that, that you could expect, but but it in, in a way, uh, yeah, you, you cannot, you cannot find it easily or, you know. Uh, so yeah, this is when it when it comes uh, uh, to that gap that I that I mentioned uh, here in this, you know, public discourse. So um, yeah, uh, and uh, also what I think that's like, um, um, public and civic initiatives uh, like ours contributed in the beginning is also um, a sort of creation of an um, um, online space and online community of, uh, you know, like, mind, like minded people. So, where they could uh, express their opinions safely and uh, opinions and views. So, uh, because in the beginning it really was not easy. And what we the feedback that we received from many of our um, members of our group uh, from here from Serbia was that they did not uh, feel uh, very comfortable like sharing or reposting uh, our our posts on social media um, because of the like um, uh, critical reaction and even attacks from their online circles, which was really, really unbelievable to me also as well. So like expressing political views which were against Russia in the in the beginning of the invasion what was not a pleasant experience for, for many people here. Um, so um, yeah, so in a way, um, this this was also a great thing, uh, this online community that, that has started with the with the invasion was an important thing for uh, for for the community and uh, for the people and also yeah um, it also helped people you know hold together um, given the like regular online harassment from these um, uh, infamous right wing uh, groups uh, with the ties to Russia like I don't know if you know this like Zli Orlovi and this this kind of thing so um, yeah. Uh, and when it comes yeah, to the major, uh, most important thing, uh, like shifting uh, opinions and attitudes towards the war in Ukraine, which was, of course, and still is one of our major um, goals, actually, um, it's, of course, really, really hard to estimate um, uh, how the, like, the level of, of how much uh, the initiatives like, like ours and others um, contributed to the change of opinions, but, uh, and the only, the most relevant um, research that I know is uh, the one made by uh, the NGO CERTA. Uh, it was done in autumn 2022, and it is uh, one of the key findings of it says, say that um, the support to Ukraine, um, like, grew from, uh, 12 to 22% uh, since May to September 2022. 
So, but still, uh, yeah, uh, when it comes to, to the like um, uh, perspectives, the uh, some 61% of people said that Serbia should maintain good relations with Russia, even uh, even at price at the price of giving up the EU integrations. So this is not something to be, you know, very, very proud of. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, um, uh, I just hope that even these two percent, uh, oh, sorry, ten percent of, of, of uh, you know, opinion uh, is something that we could also a little bit uh, contribute to. And um, yeah. So this is this is short lead. Uh, so maybe if, yeah, if you have some questions, uh, it will be easier to 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 address or yeah, to have some more time for the discussion. Thank you very much, Sasha. I think we keep um, questions for the um, end of the first round of uh, the panel. So if it's okay for you, people will come back with your uh, first uh, elements shared. So we move to the second um, panelist, Jovan Teokarevic, uh, who's professor of comparative politics at the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Belgrade. Uh, he's been teaching here and there all around, also at the uh, NATO Defense College in Rome. He's founder and director of the Belgrade Center for European Integration. And so for uh, Professor um, Jovan, a few questions and also 10 minutes, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> for the time shortage. So uh, something from your point of view uh, on the internal political debate in Serbia between the pro-Russian and pro-EU forces, how do you see this? And then uh, uh, your point of view also on the EU integration process, uh, uh, how much it has been affected uh, from the uh, war in Ukraine in the uh, Serbian case. And if you can also squeeze a little comment on the tensions of Kosovo, uh, that would be perfect, but just uh, do, do the best you can. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for these very complicated questions. I will not be able to answer all of them, but let, let me make uh, several points. Um, uh, the first thing is actually there has been no real genuine debate uh, in Serbia between the pro-European political forces and pro-Russian political forces for many reasons. The main one at the beginning of, of Russia's invasion in, into Ukraine, um, practically everybody realized, including the pro-EU uh, Serbian opposition, that the public opinion is very much uh, in favor of Russia. There are different reasons for that. Uh, and uh, the EU part, uh, the, the pro-EU part of, of the opposition didn't dare at all actually to ask for a, a much stronger anti-Russia stance or public statement or the change of, of policy. <clears throat> During the several months afterwards, as Sasha uh, was saying, uh, there has been a decrease, a declining support for Russia's invasion. And this, I have to say this because I'm, I'm Serb and I'm ashamed of this, and the declining support for brutality of Russia, Russia's war in, in Ukraine that we could see actually at the very beginning, uh, especially in, in tabloids uh, pretty much controlled by the, by the regime of Alexander Vucic. Uh, this has changed the situation to some extent, but we have never got actually to the point where we would have a, a, a real debate between the pro-EU and, and pro-Russian forces. Even now, when you see uh, this, this very interesting, actually, uh, protest in Belgrade uh, during the last month, uh, they are not actually formulated as pro-EU or pro-Russia. And it's good, actually. It's uh, the the uh, the citizens and the opposition actually found a better way to um, put the the protest into the context of uh, anti um, regimes culture of violence, which is of course something that connects the regime uh, with Russia in 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 many ways. Now. Uh, Francesco explained very well, actually, um, some of the of the basis for for this uh, 
very strange affection of Serbs towards Russia. Uh, this is a new thing, actually. That, that, that's what I wanted to say. Historically speaking, you know, this didn't exist, you know. For people who are one generation older than my generation, who remember actually the split of Yugoslavia with the Soviet Union in 1948, if they would use some kind of a time machine and come now, they wouldn't understand anything, you know, because in 44 and for many decades after actually, Yugoslavia was pretty much, although within the same political system, anti-Soviet, anti-Russian oriented. I don't know if you know that our army, the Yugoslav army used to have uh, regular exercises in which the attack was always expected from the East, never from NATO, always from the Soviet Union, the possible attack in, in this exercise, et cetera, et cetera. So now uh, people are confused and this confusion in their heads is actually a very important part of, of the explanation. There is a, a traditional anti-Western orientation of, of Serbs which has been, of course, very, very much strengthened uh, uh, because of, of NATO bombing. And this trauma is still that Serbia, uh, something that Serbia still lives in and, and about. Uh, and that, that has been actually very skillfully and very powerfully imposed by the regime uh, and by uh, tabloids, uh, controlled by the regime during the last 10 years or, or even more. So actually the, the trauma about the 1999 NATO bombing seems to, to get uh, bigger as time goes by, which is very, very strange. But, uh, and I, I, this is, I'll, I'll wrap up with the reasons for, for Serbia's uh, uh, affection or uh, enthusiasm with Russia. Uh, one has to take into account uh, everything that our public opinion polls are, are suggesting. And this is actually that there is a double kind of attitude of Serbs towards Russia. What we see now, and especially uh, in early months of 2022, was a kind of an official attitude towards Russia, which many people thought they would have to repeat if asked, including in the, the public opinion polls. But uh, many public opinion polls reveal the second image or the second aspect actually of Serbia's Serbs uh, attitude towards Russia. This is a private attitude. So it, it is very clear from all public opinion polls that when, when citizens of Serbia have to decide on private matters, and this means whether they will go and live and work in Russia or in the West, whether they will send their children to schools in Russia or the West, uh, the answers are predominantly without any, any uh, uh, problem, uh, any suspicion, uh, pro-Western ones. It's not only that uh, Serbs or, or former Yugoslavs didn't like uh, cars like Moskvich or Volga, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they do not dress, you know, uh, Russia style, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they are very much concerned about these uh, uh, private things. And uh, you can see this, you know, so the emigration from Serbia is incredible, like from the whole region of Western Balkans and, and further. And it doesn't go into direction of Russia not now, not before, and they will never, actually, people will never go there. Um, that is something that we all have to keep in mind. Can I use two, two minutes for a personal experience? And this will, this will be, become even more clear to you what I'm trying to suggest. A few years ago, I spoke with my friend's son who just got a degree in medicine and who is asking, who was asking me, when I see you on TV, in your, me, in, in my public statements, he says, I, I seem to be very anti-Russian. And I say, no, 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 you got it wrong. I'm, I like Russia very much. I'm very much against the regime. And how about you, I say? And he says, oh, I adore Russia. 
does it mean that you speak Russian? You've been to Russia? No, 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 I've never been to Russia. I don't speak to Russia. Does it mean, I ask again, that now with your diploma, or medical diploma, you will now go to some, you know, Siberian village and treat uh, people that you love? So, no, no, no. I will go to and work in Germany. How come? The answer, and this is the, how to say, uh, the reproduction the, the, of, of Serbs' minds. The answer is, Russia is there to be loved and Germany is there to, to work in. So yes, people can live with those confusing ideas in their, hand, in their heads. The last thing I want to say, I'm sorry for talking too much, it's about Russian propaganda. Many foreigners are wrong, completely wrong. If they think that some minor radio station called, I don't know, Sputnik, or some uh, very marginal website called RT uh, Balkans can influence uh, uh, people in Serbia. Nobody listens to Sputnik, nobody goes to this website. So the whole uh, job of uh, pro-Russian propaganda was being done and successfully, as we see, uh, by local national media controlled by the Vucic regime. So tabloids, Serbian tabloids, have been spreading pro-Russian propaganda and people were swallowing that with, with pleasure. About the EU integration, no, no, no. Uh, there has been nothing new, actually, nothing good uh, when it comes to EU integration and, and Serbia. There are three pillars. One is this uh, non-alignment with the EU policy versus Russia. It has been now completely clear, actually, that if only for this reason, uh, Serbia could never not only enter the EU, but mm -hmm. continue negotiations. The second pillar, there is no democracy in Serbia. And the third pillar, uh, uh, normalization relations with Kosovo, that doesn't work. Although the Franco-German plan from several months ago is very good in my opinion. And uh, we had, I think uh, rightly so, good, uh, good vibes, not only uh, in the region, but uh, out of the region in Europe and the US about this, uh, this paper that was uh, somehow without signing um, um, attracted <laughs> attention everywhere. And Kurti and Vucic accepted it, actually, uh, without signing it. But they are dragging feet, especially Vucic now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jovan. And also, I think, um, uh, addressing the propaganda and media in Serbia uh, is helping to introduce next uh, um, panelist, Denis uh, Dijic. Uh, who's the executive director and the editor of the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network in Bosnia and Herzegovina, journalist since 2006, and he worked also at the Institute for War and Peace Reporting in Sarajevo and The Hague. Uh, so for you, thanks, Dennis, for being here. Um, you're a media expert, you're a journalist, so uh, based on your point of view and also observatory um, how do you see elements of propaganda and disinformation in uh, the Bosnian and Serbian media uh, as far as the Ukrainian war uh, in the last months, and then especially on the political narratives of the main leaders in uh, uh, Bosnia and Serbia? And also, if you could uh, um, identify elements in in the media surfing that, that you probably do daily uh, that could predict or anticipate an increase in social tensions in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So the floor is yours and use it uh, as long as you can. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, uh, sure, that's uh, again a difficult question uh, in terms of uh, narrowing down to, to explain uh, what kind of disinformation tactics or which kind of disinformation narratives are present in Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and in Serbia. Uh, they're basically all, uh, everything that, that Russia basically uh, uses across uh, its myriad of, uh, of ways, which I will discuss a little bit of, of how that actually works uh, for the most part. Um, 
uh, they are all present in various kind of uh, threads, even from the most ludicrous uh, conspiracy theories uh, to the more uh, you know, common ones that we have seen from the very beginning of uh, fighting Nazis, Nazis and, and extremism in Ukraine uh, to the more uh, very sig- uh, targeted to the, uh, to the Serbian, both in Republika Srpska and in, in, in Serbia uh, population here. Uh, the, the most, uh, the, the best example of, of a very, very targeted disinformation narrative happened very relatively recently uh, in the Euro- war, uh, in the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so basically Russia uh, accused uh, Great Britain of providing uh, ammunition, uh, which had elements of uranium that isn't enriched, uh, but Russia had obviously spun this that basically that, that the UK had uh, started giving uh, the Ukrainians uh, weapons uh, that were being used in the battlefield, which had an atomic element. Um, and then the there was an increase, an avalanche of, you know, political statements, uh, statements of, uh, you know, uh, Russian proxies in the region. And then obviously we saw uh, that the local actors like the public broadcasters in Serbia and in Republika Srpska picked this up and then also their uh, own targeted um, uh, social uh, social media influencers and then uh, uh, also obviously uh, various sites that are affiliated pick this up to connect it uh, to uh, a a common uh, narrative about NATO's attack on Serbia in 1999, which basically stopped uh, uh, the the crimes that were happening in Kosovo back then um, and and stopped basically the end of the Yugoslav wars in 1999. Uh, to say that Serbian people had also suffered the crimes of NATO and its use of uh, uranium and is still suffering the consequences today. Now, and then this, uh, this puts in a nutshell really the way this kind of this kind of inf- uh, disinformation most commonly uh, the one that's most impactful happens is you have these political statements or uh, on a very on a higher level which is the spokesperson of the of the Russian uh, the foreign uh, M- foreign ministry uh, parroting uh, say, saying things that are connected to 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 Bosnia and Herzegovina or Serbia uh, we've heard when Bucha was happening uh, 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 com- comparations with uh, Srebrenica uh, obviously the genocide that took place in 1995 and again this recent example is is a good one again with the non-enriched uranium and then this gets picked up by usually, um, uh, this gets spread by various agents, which is your Sputniks, your RTs, which are available here on most of our, um, uh, on most of the, uh, the what they're called, uh, the, 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 the agencies that kind of provide TV listings. So you can watch them basically anywhere across the region. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, this can... Sh- and then afterwards, this gets picked up uh, by uh, the public broadcasters in Republika Srpska and in Serbia. And then you have in Serbia, which is a bit different than in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you have um, uh, really, really strong, uh, uh, you know, bad, bad press. Uh, basically, the the likes you see in, in Great Britain, these kind of tabloid style press, which then escalates these narratives to 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 the very extremes. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, this is mostly left out to politicians because it's a different situation, whereas Vucic basically tries to play a game in which he balances uh, certain elements of, of Russian influence with, with the West. Uh, Milorad Dodik is basically uh, just simply parroting whatever uh, Vladimir Putin wants him to or what Milorad Dodik deems that Vladimir Putin would want him to. Uh, so... Uh, uh, and then this gets picked up by a lot of other media outlets. 
which has its you know spread even in the in the federation what's important to note is that these kind of disinformation tactics uh, are for the serbian kind of population there's also another thread of this information that's kind of specifically designed for the croat and the bosniak population in bosnia and herzegovina whereas two we've seen kind of two main things that are being kind of pushed for uh, the first kind of thing that that we have seen, and, and you talked about this, how Bosnia and Herzegovina is, is basically a failed state, uh, which relies on you know interventionism by the international community and the high rep, uh, and so Russia is basically um, really really pushing this narrative of Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know, basically being. Uh, the, overly obedient to the international community to the west uh that it's um uh, that if russia you know could give advice they would give advice in the sense that the bosnian people all of them are smart enough to make their own decisions and are you know um um, and are capable to, to do this. And the only thing standing behind them is this evil big brother of the West uh, that's basically spreading chaos. Uh, so, uh, and unfortunately, this does get a bit of traction. Uh, the other kind of thing that we have seen, which is not being basically spread by uh, by you know politicians, but more by uh, through social media platforms and and uh, Russian aligned outlets is this vision of you know Putin as a strong man and um, and and Russia as this huge military power, which in a very traditional sense is something that you know obviously resonates with a lot of people. Uh, the way I, ex I explain it is is not related to to Ukraine, but a very good example happened very recently uh, when we had the pandemic. So the most watched video, uh, I think in, in 2020 from the Bosnian population in, in, on YouTube and, 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 and Facebook was a video of, of Vladimir Putin shouting at, at one of his ministries, ministers because there, was some, uh, there wasn't some kind of medication available and you know, people were standing in line in Russia wanting to buy it. So this is kind of this idea of if we had such a strong man, he would be able to solve all of our problems. Uh, and, and again, unfortunately, this is extremely popular uh, among even the other ethnicities, uh, which again is why you, you don't see, uh, if, if you look, for instance, at, um, uh, at uh, censuses and, and, and uh, you know, public opinion polls, you will see that, that Russia's, you know, kind of uh, that the overall in the federation between the Bosniaks and the Croats, the, the relationship towards the invasion is quite clear. They're condemning it. They're quite against it. But if we're talking about a very clear kind of protests against it and so forth, I don't think you would see that because, and, and we haven't seen that obviously in very large numbers, again, because I think that some of these disinformation tactics are very, very, very uh, cleverly designed in a sense that they continue uh, to play on things that, that are bothering uh, a lot of people outside the, the, the Serbian uh, 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 population world, which uh, the professor quite explained quite well. And it's a, a similar, uh, I've had similar conversations with people uh, elsewhere. Now, in terms of uh, further instability, in terms of the, I, I wanna say two things and, and I'll stop there also because my son is gonna probably shout pretty soon. So apologies for that. Uh, so the first thing is that we are seeing an increase of the disinformation tactics. So whereas the Russian embassy uh, a few months ago might've been active two or three times a week, they now have days in which they have two or three posts. Um, and uh, obviously, Milorad Dodik is, is very clearly aligned in a sense that he has put all of his eggs in the Russian basket, basically. He doesn't have a lot 
lots of other friends out there. Uh, so that's going to continue to, to play out and it's going to escalate uh, quite clearly further on. Now we'll see to which point. Uh, the second thing I think is important is that Radio Free uh, Europe in, in Serbia a few months ago published a very good investigation and, and Biren is going to pu publish a follow-up pretty soon, which for Bosnia, uh, Radio Free Europe talks about Serbia. It explains how various... Uh, diplomats who are actually operatives who were expelled from various places across the world when the invasion started have popped up in Serbia. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, Russia is, is opening a huge new, they're calling it a consulate, but it's four times bigger than the actual embassy. And we are seeing a very similar pattern. People who have been uh, uh, expelled from other places are uh, are being sent to Bosnia. Uh, now, if you combine the fact that you have political support on various levels, that you have the platform to spread this information and operatives on the ground and, and very increased number of them, I think uh, that pretty much spells out uh, what's going to happen in the, in the short and, and midterm. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis, for um, your explanation of what is happening from the media information point of view in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We stay in the country with the Professor Edina Becirevic. Thank you very much for being here. She is Associate Professor at the Faculty of Criminal Justice, Criminology and Security Studies at the University of Sarajevo. She has been studying also at the London School of Economics, University of Budapest. And she has different uh, uh, topics of interest, international security, human rights, um, restorative justice with different uh, articles and publications. Mm -hmm. So Hedina, thanks for you um, for helping us to understand from your point of view, the institutional stability and security in Bosnia and Herzegovina in relationship to the war in Ukraine. And maybe if you want to comment also in relationship to the Kosovo recent tensions, and something on the EU enlargement process for the country, what does it represent or what next steps? Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I think then covered really um, in, in, in depth the, the, the media team and, and the, the propaganda strategies and so on. Um, I will focus on security situation and um, also reflections of crisis on, on, on Kosovo and uh, the Ukrainian, um, Russian aggression on Ukraine. So I'm gonna be really short. I'd really like to leave us uh, some time for, for, for a discussion. So I can say that it seems that in a short term analysis, analysts believe that there is no threat for a serious destabilization of Bosnia and Herzegovina in, in, in the short term, even those um, some analysts are saying that on the one hand, exactly because of these um, existing tensions in Kosovo and in Serbia, it's not possible to expel in a short term the spillover um, in, in Bosnia and um, Herzegovina, uh, simply because that would be the overstretch for both uh, Serbia as with regard to Ukraine, also um, a, a, a too much of a stretch uh, for, for Russia. Um, I've noticed that in, 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 in the Bosnian media, um, there's information about the crisis on Kosovo are really very limited. There is no so much um, in-depth um, analysis, except that the tension is felt among the population. Whenever something is happening uh, in Kosovo or in the neighborhood, and particularly in Kosovo, Bosnian and Herzegovinian citizens are kind of worried that on the emotional level that it can spill um, in, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is this historical memory that in terms of crisis and later on wars, um, 
in, in uh, the former Yugoslavia, you know, the crisis began in, in, in Kosovo, and uh, that is the reason why people get really anxious in Bosnia when something is happening, uh, when something is happening um, in Kosovo. On, in, in this expert Bosnian circle, there are always two scenarios with uh, regard uh, to Kosovo. Um, some analysts believe that if the West changes the attitude with regard to um, swaps of territories and, and um, so on, um, if there is some sort of division of uh, Kosovo, that the Western international community might decide to do. Some analysts believe that in a way that might be paradoxically good for Bosnia and Herzegovina because the hegemonic appetite of Serbia would be somehow appeased if they can get, can get. Uh, part of Kosovo, or at least if it is allowed um, to Serbia to establish the, another Republika Srpska in, in Kosovo. Other analysts, on the other hand, believe that if something like that is to happen, that would actually additionally embolden Serbia to encourage uh, the Republika Srpska and eventually enable the uh, uh, Republika Srpska to join Serbia and that finally this dream of the establishing of the greater Serbia uh, might be fulfilled at the expense of um, Bosnia um, and, and, um, and Herzegovina. Um, so It, there is also a wide understanding that this uh, idea of the greater Serbia uh, is still very much alive uh, in the Serbian academic circles on the political levels. And it's only now wrapped up into this idea of the uh, Serbian world, which is mimicking the concept of uh, the Russian world and then this Serbian world is being sold to the West uh, in the concept of the open Balkans, Balkans uh, at, at uh, the international level. As it comes to the crisis uh, or to, to Russian aggression um, in, in Ukraine and how it, it affects the stability of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I've recently spoken in an interview for your uh, organization and for the research you did that uh, many analysts uh, on, on, in the regional level and, and uh, internationally believe that the war in Russian aggression on Ukraine has prevented the war in, in Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina. We all know that just couple of months before the Russian aggression on uh, Ukraine, Milorad Dodik, who is now the president of uh, Republika Srpska and the past member of the Bosnian and Herzegovina presidency has launched a secessionist plan by imposing laws that um, openly challenged the, the, the existence of the state of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And many believe that we were just one step away from the renewal uh, of, of um, the co conflict. It was very much clear uh, uh, with Vladimir Putin, his intensive connections uh, with Lavrov and, and the Russian embassy in uh, Sarajevo that all of this was happening. Um, in, that Dodik was actually inspired uh, by uh, Moscow, but it was clear to us as well that uh, you know he was also doing it um, 
inspired uh, by the official Belgrade. So paradoxically, that relationship between Putin and Milora Dodik um, helps Alexander Vucic on the international team and in his connection uh, with, uh, with, 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 uh, with, with, with the official West. Um, this relationship between Milor Dodik and Vladimir Putin is somehow a, a justification for Alexander Vucic and his excuse that it's actually Putin, not Vucic, who controls uh, Milorad's uh, uh, Dodik. So, you know, so many times Dodik stood in Belgrade by Alexander Vucic promoting the secession of uh, Republika Srpska, and he was never really properly um, um, stopped from the official Belgrade to, uh, to stop advocating uh for for uh secession now due to this very uh united uh reaction of the west after the russian aggression on ukraine uh Miller Dodik briefly stopped openly advocating secessionism because to begin with he he felt uh threatened by the west but now he continues this double game schizophrenic game, I say, to a certain extent, because one day he advocates for secessionism, brutally denying uh, genocide, spreading ethnic hatred. His rhetoric is full of uh, hate speech. And then the next day, uh, in communication with uh, European official, he advocates uh, European uh, in integration. Uh, now you also asked me to do, to 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 um, uh, address the um, re that the Bosnia and Herzegovina recently uh, received the EU candidate uh, status, and and many um, analysts are really interested in 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 the question: How is this possible to limit? Uh, the destabilization of Bosnia and Herzegovina, because it's obvious that Russia is interested in keeping the entire region in the state of permanent crisis, and possibly if, if the uh, circumstances are right, to even unable to, 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 to provoke a, a further destabilization possibly renewal of the wider conflict uh, in, 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 in the Western Balkans. Balkans. In that context, I, it seems to me that, that, that this EU candidate status is somehow a double-edged sword. Um, if the fulfillment of the conditions uh, were to be accelerated under the pressure of, of the EU, um, it's possible that Bosnia and Herzegovina could be actually stabilized. stabilized. Uh, that's the ideal scenario. That's if we were to be um, optimists. But the political scene in Bosnia is very um, chaotic. Uh, half of the country is ruled by an autocrat who was, he just recently was uh, in Moscow. Uh, uh, Putin awarded Dodik with the order of uh, Alexander Nevsky uh, for his great contribution to the development of cooperation between Russia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and for strengthening the partnership with the Republic of Srpska. So it's really difficult to explain how Dodik, who in, in, a, in an autocratic manner rules half of the country, stands by the Putin, receives his medal, can even be considered as a serious partner who will seriously integration 
of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it's reasonable to expect that these um, negotiations will take a very long time. It's a very bumpy road. Uh, so I'm saying that this candidate status is a double-edged sword because this prolonged negotiation can help um, um, uh, the increase of Eurosceptic mood across uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. For example, just was it just yesterday that uh, Milor Adrodic withdrew the judge from the constitutional court, and he almost uh, blocked uh, the functioning of Bosnia and Herzegovina. How can we expect him to genuinely work in fulfilling the, the, the uh, 14th uh, um, um, conditions um, uh, in, 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 in the future. I don't really think that is possible. So in a sense, until we have Milorad uh, Dodik uh, uh, in, in power, um, having his autocratic way, uh, I don't, I, 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 you know, it's really difficult for me uh, to be optimist about the Bosnian and Herzegovinian uh, uh, Euro integration, uh, Euro integration uh, path. So, you know, there are other difficult questions, and we don't have time uh, to discuss them. But uh, you know, the issue of uh, the election law of the very maximalistic uh, HDZ demands to strengthen the legitimate representation and to actually uh, cement the ethnocratic um, uh, parties in the future, which, which would, you know, basically um, make meaningless the existence of multi-ethnic parties in Bosnia and Herzegovina that are the only genuine political force uh, that is dedicated to Euro-Atlantic integration. It will be very, very difficult uh, sure. to find mm -hmm. that balance, but uh, I'm saying it, you know, mm -hmm. it seems to, to, to many that it will be possible, but the initial condition is that mm -hmm. Milo Nordic is gone uh, from the scene. And I'd also like to... Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Yes, Just yes, if, if you can sum up for one minute and then we, we have to give the floor to Lisa to conclude. Yeah, because I'd like to say something with regard to Serbia and the pro-Serbian uh, sure. uh, and the pro-Serbian um, um, mood in, you know, among the population uh, in Serbia. One really important reason that has not been mentioned by the, by the, by the I, I don't think properly by the, by, the, by the previous panelists, is that Russia is um, really a, a very understanding and helping, uh, um, uh, helping to the Serbian regime and Serbian uh, academic elites and the media it is uh, helping them in the denial of the Serbian role in the uh, um, uh, 1990s war. Serbia was the main generator of the wars in 1990s and the Serbian society has not um, showed willingness to face the responsibility uh, for for uh, genocide and other crimes of humanity, uh, and I, I think that Russia is the main partner who's helping them uh, stay in that illusion uh, because they look at uh, you know uh, NATO as. As, as, as the enemy and um, NATO bombing of, of, of Serbia as the trauma without really looking into causes why, first of all, there was a bombing 
uh, of the Bosnian Serb forces in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and then there why was the bombing of um, of uh, Serbia uh, in 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 the second intervention? First time the NATO force, the NATO intervention stopped genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the second time it prevented genocides in Kosovo. So until Serbian regime and the Serbian intellectual elite are ready to face that fact and to come to terms uh, with, uh, you know, with, 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 with the responsibility of Serbia, there will never be a healing of the Serbian uh, uh, society. And the healing of Serbia is important, not just for Serbia, it's important for the whole of Western Balkans. So, and I'm finished now. Thank you. I, I know we could keep talking and discussing for a really long time. Uh, I thank you everybody for being here. I leave uh, uh, Luisa Chiodi the opportunity to conclude this um, meeting that will be available on the YouTube channels and websites from OBCT and CESTI. And there you will find also the final document in the next weeks. So thank you everybody for being here. And Luisa, please go ahead. So let me as well. Thank you very much for, for your contributions, which were all extremely rich and um, I think really deserved uh, full attention and possibly for all of us, think it over with um, some more energy after this uh, long discussion. I um, want to um, conclude uh, not only by thanking you, by uh, recalling a, a couple of things that were said that I think um, in particular, um, I think, reminded me uh, a centrality of a couple of points. Um, indeed, uh, there are different views uh, when we discuss uh, events and the enlargement process and the stability of the region, um, East and West, so-called, or Western Balkans and member states or Western, Euro, um, Western world. Um, these different views are really different readings of the context often. Um, and I think we should more and more pay attention to local understanding of uh, what is going on. And in particular, it's very clear that there was this idea that the war um, uh, and, and the, the candidacy of um, Ukraine and Moldova uh, um, could really speed up the process and this uh, recreate um, a, lo a lot of uh, new um, um, enthusiasm, or let's say, um, uh, readiness to work in this favor. This um, Western view of, of the situation is really very different seen from the Balkans. Um, there is rather um, an idea of uh, um, rather Western, um, rather the idea that the Ukrainians will be deluded as much as uh, the Western Balkans were for, may, for, for very many years, but also um, a, a different reading of what this uh, can be done and what it will happen in the near future to the point that yes steps were made by um by for instance including uh, the candidacy of bosnia and the rest of things that were stressed but this instead of really creating a new uh, potential instead recreated a situation of double um, double games or new and um, and I think this different reading of the context goes also for what is the role of this information and also who is the responsible for this information. And in particular, I think it has been stressed repeatedly today how much it is a, a question of local political elite that make the difference in um, using this information um, at the local level um, rather than just uh, being manipulated from, um, from Russia as a malign external actor. Um, uh, indeed, um, uh, Ukraine is a country where when the war will stop, the, the, or it, it, it is already the case today, um, is a place where there is a, a lot of strong uh, uh, intention to reform and the risk that uh, the Balkans are being left behind. And this is a real risk um, that uh, officially, at least the Italian government seem to be interested to avoid. But unless we create a context at local level that is responsive to, to this um, opening of possibilities, there is no uh, chance that uh, we succeed. And indeed, I think it was extremely relevant to 
see um, how positive and important it was the contribution from a, an external internal actor such as the Ra democratic Russian community that is being settled in in Serbia, being a voice uh, that is able to somehow break the 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 negative um, the narratives that are uh, there. So a voice. It um, um, makes a difference because it, it's really a non-aligned voice uh, this time. Um, but in general, of course, we should remind ourselves how important this idea of this strong men patriarchal culture that uh, uh, mirrors in the strong Putin uh, and a strong military power um, itself, and um, that is a culture that uh, should be uh, constantly fought against um, on, on all sides, uh, including uh, especially uh, considering uh, the role of actors such as the one that talked today in our seminar, um, that he, uh, uh, should be given much more relevance um, in, in our understanding of what is going on. In general, um, Indeed, uh, uh, the media um, and political elite should be more and more a focus of concern on um, the European Union and member states uh, and in their specific relationship, regardless of Russian propaganda for how important they are in shaping uh, public opinion and moving public opinion according to um, uh, local elite interests that uh, in, in a couple of cases, cases that have been mentioned repeatedly are clearly no longer democratic uh, figures um, that uh, somehow play um, this constant fear of a cat new catastrophe um, in their, um, their interests. Um, the time has gone, so I really shouldn't go further. Um, indeed, the risk that uh, the West uh, continues insisting on stabilitocracy as it was criticized for years, uh, even today in front of uh, the new um, revamping of the, the tension in, uh, in the Kosovo-Serbian relations is there. And we should, uh, I think, make uh, the largest effort to uh, make sure that an, a clear understanding of the context uh, ar um, arrives uh, to, um, to member states, to the European Union in general, um, uh, avoiding to project our own understanding of the situation, our own views of, of the things. So um, thank you very much again for the contribution you provided and hopefully uh, new, more stronger voices uh, of democratic forces will be able to gradually carve out the space for um, an integration of this region into the European Union for real and not only with the, um, with the um, propagandistic uh, claims as it is often appears to be the case. Thank you. Bye-bye, ciao. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.